evening, everyone, and welcome to Play It Safe, Physical Activity with a Bleeding Disorder, part of the National Hemophilia Foundation's Make Your Move Physical Therapy webinar series. This new series is supported by a cooperative agreement from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Our presenter this evening is Grace Hernandez. Grace graduated from the University of Delaware Physical Therapy Program in 1990. She began her career in physical therapy working as an inpatient physical therapist at St. Joseph Hospital in Orange and Children's Hospital of Orange County in 1990. The Hemophilia Treatment Center started at CHOC in 1993, and Grace has been the primary physical therapist for the HTC since the inception. She served as the Southern California Regional Representative for Region 9 from 1995 to 2004, and as physical therapy representative to the Physical Therapy Working Group for NHF from 2001 to 2004. From 2013 to 2016, Grace was the chair of the Physical Therapy Working Group for NHF. In 2014, she was awarded the PT Fellowship Grant from NHF for a research project looking at growth motor, motor delays in children with hemophilia. For the past three years, she has been working full-time at the HTC, now called the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders which serves children and adults with all types of inherited blood disorders. Welcome, Grace Hernandez. Our program will conclude with a question and answer segment. To ask a question, please go to the area in the far lower left of your, of your webinar screen and type your question in the field just to the left of the send button, which is located in the pod or area labeled chat. Click the send button when you have finished typing your question. However, please note that your question will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The PowerPoint presentation will be available as a handout. However, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the National Hemophilia Foundation website at www.hemophilia.org. For more information, please visit www.stepsforliving.org hemophilia.org. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Grace Hernandez. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. And we are going to discuss, as she told you, about physical activity and sports participation for people with bleeding disorders. Um, I just have a couple professional disclosures I have to give uh, that I serve on a speaker program for Aptivo Biotherapeutics and also as a consultant for Novo Nordis. So with no further ado, we'll move on. The objectives for this webinar are for, to recognize why exercise is beneficial for you and the people you care for, understand the importance of being active at all stages of life, identify ways to be prepared and safe while engaging in physical activity, and also increase the knowledge of specific sports-related injury risk. So why should you exercise and play sports? I know some people when they hear the word exercise, it may give them a negative feeling like the word homework, chores, or dieting. But I hope by the end of this presentation, you will view exercise as a vital part of your life to keep your body healthy and as important as things like breathing and eating. So first, let's look at many ways your body can benefit from physical activity. First, we're going to talk about how it can strengthen your muscles because strong muscles give you power, speed, and stability, which gives support to your joints, which is really important for preventing joint bleeds and injuries. It also makes your bones strong. The way bones get stronger is through weight-bearing activities during standing, walking, or using your arms for pushing and activities like that, as well as also from forces being applied to the muscles when you're doing activities like lifting, carrying, running, and jumping. So strong bones will decrease the risk for breaks and fractures. 
It raises your energy level and endurance. So by being physically fit, it allows you to perform an activity for a longer period of time before you get tired or out of breath. It also can increase your flexibility. Muscles need to be strong, but they also need to be flexible so that they stretch with every movement your body makes without straining or tearing them. It can develop your coordination, which allows your body to move with smooth motions using good form and responding quickly to position or direction changes. Balance is so important to prevent unnecessary falls and injuries during normal activities throughout the day, as well as during sports and recreation. Here are some other ways your body benefits from exercise. The importance of maintaining a healthy body weight applies to everybody, even people without bleeding disorders, because being overweight increases the stress on your joints of the body, which can lead to early wearing of the bony surfaces. It also makes your muscles work harder, fatigue faster, and makes all activity more difficult. So increased stress on the joint and wearing of the bone surface is particularly um, important for people with bleeding disorders because when there are frequent or repeated bleeds into joints, it actually causes early destruction and wearing down of the bony surfaces. So by being overweight, it can kind of compound the joint problems that we see with people with bleeding disorders. Being overweight can also make it a little more difficult to find your veins for infusion access because if you're overweight and have extra fat tissue, it usually is located right under the skin, so that might hide. The veins are kind of deeper down. It's harder to find them, and making access for infusions much more difficult. There are also many diseases that can be avoided for people with good diet and healthy lifestyles like heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and colon cancer. When kids and adults can participate in physical activities and sports with their peers, it has been shown to have a positive impact on the person's social and emotional development. By being able to be physically active and participate in sports with your peers, it's shown to improve self-confidence and self-esteem, promote teamwork, and improve academic performance, as well as decrease the feelings of depression. So can people with bleeding disorders be active? There are several studies that have been done on physical activity and sports for people with bleeding disorders to show that it is safe and have demonstrated improved physical function. This is a, outlining some of the results of studies that have been done internationally and within the United States. Ones have shown that appropriate physical activity or guided exercise programs have shown to increase strength and also can decrease the bleeding episodes. Home exercises can be done safely to increase your strength, which means you're not going to have any adverse reactions or increased bleeding episodes. It's shown to improve balance and muscle tone, which can help prevent falls. And also, if you have adequate factor access in certain countries, there's been shown to be an increase in sports participation. So in countries where we have ac factor access and children are with severe hemophilia are on prophylactic factor infusions, it has been shown that they have a higher participation rate in sports. Like in the Netherlands, a study was done and it showed that 80% adults who had access to prophylaxis as children participated in sports. Where some countries like in Mexico, where most of the patients are still on demand treatments, they did a study and found that more than 70% of those children and adults that didn't have access to factor were either inactive or only participated in low risk activities. So here in America, there is adequate access to factor products, but the study was done by the Hugs group and they found that with the survey, most kids are still just active through free play with their friends and not from organized sports participation. So what are some of the barriers to being active and wanting to participate in sports. 
In regards to bleeding disorders, some of the main concerns are fear of injuries and bleeds. If there's already an underlying joint problem, this concern may be increased. Other considerations are what is your current phys physical fitness level? Is your body ready for the amount of physical activity required by a certain sport or activity? Time is always a huge barrier. For children, homework may leave little time for activity. For parents, they have work and many other life responsibilities may provide little opportunity for fun, recreation, and sports. Money and costs have become an increasingly increasing barrier, so much so that some people cannot afford to play sports anymore. I remember when I was in high school, no one paid to play sports. The school district provided all the funds for all the sports and transportation. Today, high school sports can cost in the thousands of dollars. Youth sports programs can be costly too. In Southern California where I live, typical uh, season for a recreational basketball or baseball league would be $250. A recreational soccer season would cost up $110. Martial arts or gymnastics classes once a week may cost over $125 a month. Some club soccers can be cost in the thousands. Also, gym memberships can be very expensive depending where you live and may have added costs for fitness classes. So these are all things that may inhibit or prevent people from being able to participate in sports and activities they would like to. Also, depending on what activity you may choose, it may be a far drive to get to the gym or the practice location, or the outdoor recreational activities you may want to participate in would require a long car ride. Like if you wanted to go skiing or do something up in the mountains, it might be two hours, five hours away to be able to do those activities. Safety is also a big concern for some people. Where we live, some of the neighborhoods that the kids live in are not very safe for them to be outside and playing with friends or at the park, so that limits how much they can be active. Some areas have high crime, or it just might be too trafficy. or a lot of areas where we live in Southern California, there aren't a lot of parks and outdoor places to play and be active. Now we're going to move on to how activity changes as we grow. So we're going to start in the early childhood years. Babies and toddlers are always on the move. They have full of energy and are constant moving and repeating the same motions and activities over and over again. Each skill they learn is built on the one they mastered before, and they build a, a solid foundation usually before moving on to the next skill. So you can see in the picture, first they're learning how to sit, before they can learn how to stand, before they can learn how to walk. So they're pra constantly practicing their balance. Um, they get stronger by doing crawling, climbing, and pushing activities. You, they learn their coordination by throwing, catching, batting, and kicking activities. And they also get their fitness in by running, jumping, and then as they get a little older they can start using some pedaling with um, wheeled um, devices such as scooters or little sit-down push toys and things like that. However, they need a helping hand to learn each skill safely. By being right there when they are climbing up and down the stairs or a ladder at the park allows them to develop the arm and leg strength while preventing falls. So it's important to put gates on stairs so that they don't climb up and down the stairs unsupervised. But you should allow them to learn how to first crawl up the stairs, maybe scoot down the stairs on their bottom, and then eventually help them learn how to walk up and down the stairs by holding onto the rail in your hand. Also, when they're playing on the playground equipment at the park, it is very important for you to have close contact, hand contact on them so if they happen to let go of the swing, they're not going to fall backwards and hit their head until they learn the safety and how to use all the equipment safety without falling off. Playing on soft surfaces and making sure their heads and limbs are protected with safety gear will also lessen the impact during falls. So especially when they're learning how to use scooters or bikes or tricycles, it's really important, obviously, that they wear a helmet, but you might even want to add knee and elbow pads just to protect those little bony areas that might fall and hit the cement if their bike tips over. Using soft balls and foam balls at first. So when you're learning how to play baseball or kick a ball around or hit with a racket, choose balls that are soft and the bats that are soft so that when they haven't mastered the skills how to kick and hit right, if they inadvertently get hit, it won't be with a hard ball that might cause 
a bleed, or a big large bruise. Playing on a soft surface like grass or padded playground floors is recommended to decrease the impact when landing or falling. So most playgrounds have either wood chips or a lot of them have that rubber material now so that when the kids jump off the equipment or fall down off the monkey bars or going off the slides and things like that, they're going to land on a soft surface. One of our families even put those interlocking rubbing, rubber squares that you can get like the play mats inside their house because they had tile floors. And when their infant was learning how to be mobile and crawl and walk, they wanted to decrease the bruising that they got on their knees and also any bleeding that might occur from them falling. So every kid is supposed to be active every day. And they recommend that young kids are engaged in vigorous and moderate activity levels. So moderate activities are those that you can still that you can participate and do, but you're still able to talk during the activity. And vigorous activities are ones that maybe you can only get a few words out while you're doing the activity. So this is our first poll question, and I would like everyone to choose how many minutes a day do you think is recommended by the U.S. government for kids ages 6 to 17 to be active in moderate to vigorous activities? Okay, so the, we have the answer is 60 minutes, and that is what most everybody chose, and that is the correct answer. So it's very important for you to um, make sure that your kids get that amount of activity, because I know it's hard to always get in 60 minutes a day, but that is what's recommended for young kids, even all the way up through high school. So with kids, it's 60 minutes a day. With adults, they split it up more into weekly recommendations. So for adults, it's 150 minutes of moderate activity. And then they want you to incorporate at least 75 minutes of vigorous activity. So now we're going to look at the school age years. So this would be including kids more like preschool through elementary school. So early school age years, most kids get their physical activity, playing with their peers, doing free, free time at recess and lunch break. So some of the activities the kids might do at school are playing on the playground equipment, running around, playing tag, throwing, and shooting ball games. Like I know the kids play handball a lot now, basketball, volleyball. They could be doing kicking, playing soccer, kickball, and then hitting ball games like we said with um, tether ball or handball. And I, the kids still participate in things like jumping rope. So that's just a good way for kids to run around and be active and get physical activity. And I think most schools have at least one or two recesses plus a lunch break where kids are active for at least 15 minutes at a time. So maybe by the end of the school day they get in about 45 minutes of physical activity. However, just to make sure that they're getting the recommended amounts of physical activity, it is good for them to do some kind of after school activities. So some of these could be a sports team. You might have them in sports teams or even just physical activity classes like martial arts classes or other types of tennis lessons, swimming lessons. You could have them in some kind of fitness classes or just with the family or peer activities. Are you going to go for a long walk after school, play with their friends at the park, or if you even have areas for them to play in your backyard or you have a basketball hoop, then the kids can come over to your house and play. Organized sports can even start as young as four years old, like soccer or t-ball. They start as young as four. Um, if you're going to have them start playing sports, it is good for you to pick sports that develop different 
physical skills. So a sport like soccer might be really great for lower body fitness and coordination, but unless you play goalie, there's not a lot of hand-eye uh, strength requirements or um, coordination skills. So make sure they're playing another game that's working on their upper body too. With kids, it's really important to try a whole bunch of different variety of sports because not all kids are going to love the sport you loved growing up or enjoy playing team sports. Some kids excel more at individual sports like tennis or running or um, some other golf, some other activity where you're doing, you might be playing on a team, but you are doing the activity yourself. And always the main goal, especially in the young age when the kids are learning skills and trying new activities, is fun should be the main goal. So kids at this age really need to be exploring and having fun and trying different sports and being supported to do all different things no matter how good they are or how they do, and it should always be fun. Family fitness is also a very important aspect at this young age for um, exercise because most kids in the preschool and elementary school aren't necessarily out unsupervised playing and getting activity. So you can, as a family, can promote this kind of activity. So if you can, depending on the weather, this time of year might limit how much outdoor recreation activities you can do, but that is something that you really should try to incorporate into your family weekly activities you have scheduled. If you have young kids and even through elementary when they're learning sports skills, which means throwing, catching, dribbling, shooting, kicking, whatever might they be doing with balls and different kinds of activities, you can teach those skills at home and practice with the kids so they can get better at them, but also get the physical activity that they need. You, also, when you go on vacation, it is important to try to plan out act, physical activities as part of the vacation. So try not to have a completely sedentary vacation when you go there. So plan every day some kind of physical activity in every day when you're on vacation. And then you as a parent obviously need to be the role model for fitness for life. So if you're still active and doing things and being act outdoors and being physically fit, your kids will see that as something that they need to do throughout their life and as an important part of keeping themselves healthy even at, when they become an adult. So now we're going to move into the middle school and high school years. So all children eventually will participate in some kind of organized sports in school, whether it be during physical education classes or if they decide to play a sport for their school or just get involved in some city league or club team or recreational sport team. So in middle school, Physical education classes might even start as early as fourth grade back in elementary school, but that's usually just done a couple times a week. But by middle school, most children will be doing many sports and activities in PE class on a daily basis. And then in high school, typically the requirements for PE are usually just one to two years. And if you are playing a sport for your high school, that usually counts as your physical education class. So that would be your sport training after school would be your PE class. Out here in California, the kids in middle school and even in high school complete the presidential fitness test. And usually they will do this test at the beginning of the year and then again at the end of the year to see their improvement and also see if they scored well enough to get the national or presidential fitness award. So it's important for your kids to be physically active and to be able to be physically fit and prepared so that they can participate in these activities in physical education class. And these activities include endurance, which is a timed mile run, strengthening activities, which are push-ups, sit-ups, and then they can do chin-ups or just try to hold on with an arm hang with their arm, holding onto a bar with their arms flexed for a certain amount of time. But then they've also added flexibility extra activities which include sitting and trying to reach past your toes for your leg flexibility and then are you able to clasp your hands behind your back for your arm flexibility. So it is important that you get your kids out there active and starting to do these kind of activities and exercises before they get to middle school so that they can participate with their peers and um, meet the requirements for the standards for their class. 
if there's any range of motion limitations or areas of concern, depending on if they've had any problems with their bleeding in joints or muscles in the past, you can work with your hemophilia treatment center to maybe make some modifications to this test so that they can still participate and get a good um, grade for the class. Let's look at some other aspects to consider before starting a specific sport. So organized sports, you kind of want to get prepared before you try a sport. Little kids, if they're going out and playing soccer or t-ball or something, the activity is usually not as physically exerting as if you start a sport when you're 13 that you've never played before. So it really depends on how old you are when you're starting that sport on how demanding that sport is going to be depending on your prior level of physical activity. So um, some things you might want to address at the hemophilia treatment center with your physical therapist or with a doctor and stuff if you have any range of motion limitations. So if you have any limitations, just kind of knowing what they are, if they're going to affect your ability to do that activity, if you need to make any modifications so you can still do the activity to accommodate the decreased motion in your joint. You want to start stretching for flexibility because as we mentioned earlier, all your muscles need to be able to flex and stretch and move in all different ways for different sports and activities depending on what you're going to do. So you want to make sure you have the flexibility to do that type of sport and you're not going to pull a muscle which might cause it to tear and get a little bleed or even a big bleed. Um, make sure that you have strengthened important muscle groups. So depending on what kind of activity, if you're going to be playing soccer, you're going to need a lot of lower body strength, not as much upper body. But if you're going to be doing activities like swimming, you need your arms and legs just as strong and um, some other activities might require a little more arm strength than lower extremity strength um, depending on what is the demand of that activity. You want to build up your endurance. So you think about your endurance, how long you can perform an activity. So if you aren't able to like let's say run a mile and you have to do that in PE class next year, you want to start progressing your endurance slowly, maybe do jog running around the block and then go a little farther try to jog longer than you do walking and eventually be able to jog the whole distance. So just try to slowly build up. It takes weeks and maybe months to kind of build up your endurance. So don't expect to, if you can only jog up the street, to be able to run a mile by the next week. Also, for all sports and activities, you need to have coordination and agility. So we talked about like the catching and dribbling, kicking, all the different activities that you might need to do. You want to make sure you practice those skills over and over again. So if you're playing something like baseball, you're really good and accurate at catching balls and throwing them. If you're playing soccer, you want to develop your eye coordination with your legs so that you can drop kick a ball if you're the goalie, or you have good accurate kicking for passing to your teammates or scoring a goal. You also want to be able to quick move and change directions quickly if you're playing a type of sport that requires those activities. And also work on balance and stability because everybody for any type of sport you need to have good stable joints and good balance. Other considerations to think about when choosing a sport is there a high injury risk just the way the sport is played. So some sports are just dangerous because that's the way the sport's played. Like tackle football, boxing, mixed martial arts. There isn't really a way that that sport, just from the way that the sport and the rules are, that it is not going to be dangerous or a high risk for an injury for participating in those sports. Also, some of the, depending on the type and condition of the playing surface, so hard court sports, you're going to do a lot of running, stopping, jumping, landing on a hard surface like both volleyball and basketball versus if you're running on a soft grass or a dirt field. It might, it's less stress on your joints. Also, the playing surface. So some fields, even though you're playing on a grass field, it's really uneven and there are holes in it, so it can pose a higher risk for you to twist your ankle or um, fall down. Some sports require repetitive motions, like you think about tennis, pitching in baseball, or swimming. So that just might put a high demand on certain muscle groups. Do you, does, does the certain position in the sport require staying in prolonged positions? You think about playing a catcher, 
in baseball or softball puts a lot of stress on your joints and your legs because you have to be in a squatting position most of the game. The more protective equipment that's required obviously is going to increase the risk of injury because if you need all that protective gear, there's a reason for it. You're either going to get impact with a ball or a puck or a stick or because you're going to be running into other people on the field. And the other thing is just is there certain increased stress on certain joints and muscles. So maybe if you have a really ankle that's giving you a whole lot of trouble, some of those court sports aren't going to allow you to be successful playing that because there's a lot of landing and jumping on that ankle over and over again, and it just might cause too much trouble. So just kind of make, take those kind of considerations before choosing a sport. Okay. So sports are very popular in America for young children, but I want you to take time right now and try to guess what percentage of kids drop out of organized sports by age 13. Okay, so the answer is 70%, which is what everybody answered. And that number always surprises me as a physical therapist because I always think, you know, we're so pro activity and sports and getting people back in the game. And I was really surprised that the number of kids that are playing sports at a young age that that many drop out by age 13. So some of the reasons that have been shown why kids stop playing sports and one of the main reasons was it's not fun anymore. So I just sometimes I stop and wonder, have we taken all the fun out of sports with all the overcoaching, overtraining, lack of kids just having fun and playing with their friends without all the constant input from adults on how their performance is with every little activity during the sports. Um, there's also too much stress on winning. Some of the things I've heard is like if the coach is all about winning, 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 you know, and then it just kind of makes the kids get stressed out. If they don't win, then they're not good at the sport. But if you play any sport at any level, you can't win all the time. So you have to be able to accept losing and learn from your mistakes or maybe the other team was better trained and in better shape than you and you'll do better next time. Um, but I don't think that should be what kids are focusing on if they win the game or not. It should be about learning and playing and improving. Also, sports have become very time consuming and the kids are getting very burnt out. So the pictures on the side over here kind of show kids doing all these like CrossFit agility extra training. So some sports the kids are already practicing three, four, five times a week with their coach and then maybe their parents or their Coach are suggesting they do additional training. So now the kids are doing sports activities every day for a couple hours and they're just getting burnt out because they have no free time. Negative coaching tactics. So what I mean by this is, you know, putting too much pressure on winning, players' performance. They've, some of the kids have quit playing because all they do is practice and they never actually get to play in the game because the coaches are always playing favorites. So that can really burn kids out if they never get a chance to actually play in the game. And all they do is all the training for the sport. Also, this is um, injuries, obviously, are another reason people stop playing sports when 50% of injuries in youth athletes occur from overtraining and overuse, not necessarily from some kind of injury that happened during the sporting event. It's just because their body's worn out and over fatigued that they end up getting injured during the game or practice. More, more training doesn't allow your fatigue muscles to recover, and this puts you at a higher risk for injury. And then there's also, let's not forget it, about the parental pressure and expectations. Lots of parents I hear talking about, you know, their high school athlete is going to get a scholarship, 
a college scholarship, but you know they've done statistics that a very low percentage of kids that play high school sports actually get college scholarships, and then one percent of college athletes will actually become professional athletes. So, you know, we shouldn't have sports focus about winning, getting a scholarship, and making money. We have to go back and think about what was the point when they were young. It was about having fun, right? But we lose the fun as we get older. So if we quit playing sports or don't have the opportunity to keep playing sports, how can we continue to be physically active as we get older? Your body does crave physical activity. Our bodies were not meant to be idle and sitting at the desk for eight hours a day and then going home and sitting at the dinner table and then sitting and watching TV. And so we have to remember that our bodies need physical activity every day. So after you get out of high school, maybe you're in college, young adult, as you get to be an older adult, these are some ways that we can still be physically fit if you're not participating in organized sports. In college, if you're not playing for your college team, you can play intramural sports, which are recreational sport leagues within the college. Very fun, very great way to keep physically fit during college days. There's a fitness gym and equipment, classes you can take, outdoor recreation. If you don't have time to get to the gym or it's too expensive, there's online exercise classes, workout. You can do individual hiking. And don't forget hiking, jogging, cycling. Don't forget that cleaning the house, doing chores and yard work is a good way to get strong and burn calories too. And as we get older, we need to make sure that we include strength training, flexibility, and balance. Because as we get older, we get a little more prone to straining muscles. We lose our flexibility, which can cause pain. And also, if our balance isn't good, it just puts us at a higher risk for falling and getting fractures and injuries. So before and after exercise, you want to make sure you warm up. I'm sure you've all heard this, got to warm up and cool down. So this is a nice picture because here's a picture of these you know, high-level professional rugby players, but they're still doing these easy kind of warm-up activities to get their muscles ready, their heart rate slowly worked up before they have a really vigorous workout or game, and then they're going to cool down after the game, and everybody should do that before any type of activity so that we don't get an injury making our bodies go full on from a resting mode. So make sure um, when you're being physically fit that you try to make exercise and activity a part of your daily routine, whether it's walking your kids to school, taking the stairs at work, whatever it is. Try to fit some kind of physical activity, taking your dog for a walk every day, whatever it is, put some kind of physical activity in your daily life. And don't forget that sports and activity interests change over time. Like we were talking about little kids run around and play, then you get in organized sports, and then we start doing other kind of fitness activities when we get older. All fitness and strength takes time. As you look over here, this is like a uh, way to see that if you're going to be physically active and work on strengthening, you're not going to see a change for four weeks, your friends and family for eight weeks, and the rest of the world for 12 weeks. So make sure you set realistic goals, but also celebrate your achievements. Um, so let's move on to how to be plan for the sport, be prepared, and prevention. So but we want to make sure that if you're going to start a sport or activity or have an, or questions about sports and activities your child could do, you want to consult with the medical team at the Hemophilia Treatment Center. So discuss with them activities or sports that you are interested in starting or ones that you think about in the future you might want to have your child participating in. Then you can decide on factor infusion regimens. If you're not taking factor regularly, like for prophylaxis regimens where you take it in a preventative way two, three times a week or less depending on if you're using extended half-life products, you can discuss with your team if you should be doing factor infusions depending on the sport or activity you might be doing to prevent an injury. You can also get a physical therapy evaluation, and we're really great at identifying areas of concern that can be addressed before starting the activity. You can also learn the risks associated with the activity so that you can um, decide if that is a good choice for you, or maybe you want to talk about doing a different activity, and also make a plan before starting the activity. We kind of talked about getting your body in shape and things that you might want to do thinking ahead before you start a sport or a different kind of fitness activity that your body might not be ready to do. So the way the physical therapist can really help you get ready for a new type of sport or activity is um, 
by identifying areas that physical areas of concern. So this would be like if you have muscle weakness or imbalance, maybe one muscle is super tight on one side versus the other might pose an area to get a muscle strain. If one of your joints have limitation, if you have like balance, alignment issues, and things like that. So we can identify areas that might be of concern for a certain sport. Also teach you exercises that will increase strength, flexibility, or balance that will help you be successful doing the sports. We can recommend supportive braces or equipment that might help support your ankle, your knee, playing basketball or other type of sports to help prevent injuries. We can also discuss modifications to decrease the risk of injury during the activity. We can also recommend specific sports or activities. So maybe you don't have an idea of a sport that you might want to participate in or are trying to figure out what's the best activity for you to do and you have an elbow problem. We can go over some sports and activities that might be beneficial for you and also protect your area like your elbow from getting injured or getting pain during the activity. We are really good at helping you manage and recover from your injuries and bleed. So besides using your factor to help stop the bleeding and recover from the bleeding, there's lots of other things that you can do to help your body recover and get back into your physical activity of your daily life, playing your sport, or back doing your fitness regimen. And physical therapists, that's what we do. That's what our main job is, is to help people get mobile and recover from injuries and recover their strength and motion and mobility. So thinking ahead of the game, you want to definitely make sure you have a factor plan in place, whether you're going to be changing the days you take your factor to accommodate when the games are, like some patients might do factor Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but now their games are on Saturday, so they might want to change and do Tuesday, Thursday, and make sure they take factor on Saturdays before their game. You always want to have your medical alert identification with you, on you, because as you get older, and maybe you're playing in high school, and you're going to be traveling to other schools with the sports team, and an unforeseen accident, injury could happen where you're not able to verbalize to the um, emergency people that would come and take care of you, that you have hemophilia and things like that. So you want to make sure that you always have your medical identification with you if that kind of emergency happens. You also want to be very good at recognizing bleeds and maybe injuries so that you know when it's time to stop doing practice or stop doing the game if you get a bad bleed or a bleed during the physical activity. And also learning how you can manage your bleeds and injuries with your factor, with the other recommendations by the therapist and the medical team so that you can limit the amount of bleeding, get, get your function back, and get back playing and doing activity as soon as possible. So the informed team plan includes the athlete, the parents, the hemophilia treatment center staff, your coach or trainer, and the school staff. All these people should be involved when thinking about planning sports and activities. So the National Hemophilia Foundation has created a booklet called Playing It Safe. Um, it's an activity rating scale booklet that goes over different sports and activities and gives them a rating on their risk for injury. And these are the five different injury risks risks that they have come up with. However, they have modified and updated this book, and the new version should be out in like three to four months, I heard, will be available on the website. And this new version has updated information, more statistics about health and well-being, and also has taken some of these sports, instead of giving them a specific number risk, has put more of a range. Because some sports when you play when you're a young child aren't as aggressive and dangerous for risk as when you get older and are playing maybe in high school and college and professional level. Playing soccer when you're four years old is really not as aggressive and much of a contact sport. And then when you get into college where people are doing more slide tackling, and you have more injuries occurring at those ages. So they've gone through and changed some of the ratings so that there's a risk range depending on how old you are and depending how you play that activity. So the first slide goes over some of the low risk activities that most people with bleeding disorders can participate in safely. And the reason I say most people, because everybody has different um, areas of concern, different bleeding, 
um, risks and stuff. So obviously you need to discuss all this with your hemophilia treatment center before starting any activity. But most of these have low risk for injury. If you're looking at a sport for your kid or for you to do in high school and college that you could be competitive in, swimming and golf are two like team sports that are up through high school and college activities. As you get up in the risk a little bit, it is just adding some of the fitness equipment at the gym that might put a little more stress or impact on some of your joints and muscles, and some of the fitness classes that require a little more strength, um, flexibility for your muscles, like the body sculpting resistance and yoga. As we get into the moderate risk, now you're getting more impact type of activities, running, jogging, jumping rope, so you're getting more leg impact. You get aerobics and cardio kickboxing where you're getting a little more quick, fast movements. And then also with the kickboxing class, which is showed in this picture here, you know, the people are just practicing like punching and kicking moves, but you're not actually sparring with somebody. And then some activities that might put a little stress on your arm would be tennis, which is a little hard on your ankle and knee joints too, and then bowling because you're using a heavy ball and doing a repetitive activity. As you get into more of the moderate high risk, you're going to pull in more of the team ball sports that are listed here. And most of these are the kind of team sports that you would be participating in if you decide to go on and be competitive like in high school and college. So you just kind of want to be aware as you get older and the sports get a little more aggressive and the people get a little more muscular and big that the sports can sometimes become a little more injury prone. Also some of these other activities listed are things that you would be doing outdoor recreational like river rafting, ice skating, ice, you know, horseback riding, skate and snowboarding and downhill skiing. Obviously, some of those activities aren't as high a risk if you're just like skateboarding straight or just learning how to snowboard and skate, um, ski down the mountain at like a lower beginner trails. But as you get better at it and you start adding tricks and harder runs and stuff, then the um, activity can obviously get more of a high risk for injury. Then there are some sports and activities that are just a high risk for injury because the way the sport is played, there isn't really um, modifications to the sport to make them less injury prone. So this is just kind of a list of the sports that are kind of a higher risk for injuries, which would be all the high contact sports like football, lacrosse, rugby, ice hockey, roller hockey, boxing obviously. Um, some of the other sports listed, listed here are more the racing with motorized um, vehicles with the racing, motocross and snowmobiling, and then obviously some of the rodeo stuff because you're on a moving animal at high speeds and doing turns and you have a high risk for falling off and injuries. And then power lifting would be, as opposed to just strength training and weight lifting, power lifting is more like max, your max amount of weight you can lift one time. So that was just puts a big stress on your joints and your muscles that could be lead to a high risk of injury. Um, these are sports if you are thinking about participating in and activities, definitely you need to talk to your medical team at the Hemophilia Treatment Center because you really need to have a set plan in place and um, recommendations and really get support and get everybody involved before you would ever um, participate in these kind of sports without having a nice plan in place to prevent any kind of serious injuries occurring. And then if an injury occurs, how are you going to manage it afterwards? You always need to have a plan in place. So I hope going through all of this stuff has encouraged people to be physically active and why it's so important, especially for people with bleeding disorders because there's very important physical, health, social, and emotional benefits for um, people with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. It's very important whether you have hemophilia or not or other bleeding disorders to make exercise and activity a priority in your life because everybody needs physical activity to maintain healthy body weight, keep your joints, your joints flexible and your muscles strong. Okay? And also as you go through life and throughout your childhood, and you get into middle school and high school and college and you become a young adult and become an older adult, make sure you keep trying many different activities and sports because people's 
interests change, your body changes, your time in your life for having free time to do certain activities will change. So make sure you keep trying different sports even as you get older because you might find something you never had an opportunity to try when you were younger. Now you really enjoy it as you get older. And then the most important thing is have your treatment plan in place and have your medical team a part of your um, decision in doing physical activities and sports. And then also just being aware of the risks and how to be safe when you're going to do any kind of sport or activity. So I hope everybody will be um, thinking about keeping physical activity and sports um, part of their life or um, incorporating it into your life now or planning ahead for the future if you, you know, have a child that's a little kid and you're thinking about the future. I hope this presentation has helped you feel like it is a safe and important part of a kid's um, well-being and physical abilities and is safe for them to do even with a bleeding disorder. Okay? So um, now we're at the end of the presentation, and these are just some references where I got some of the information to, for the presentation. Um, I am just going to look and go over and see if anybody has any questions that they have submitted. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question via the web presentation, select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen, then type and send your question. If you would like to ask a question live via your phone, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. I will announce each caller prior to bring you into the conference. Please remember if you have your phone on mute, take it off mute when you are selected to ask your question. Once again, to ask a question via the web presentation, select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen, then type and send your question. And to ask a live question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Thank you. And Grace, we have no live questions at this time. Okay. Well, um, let me just, I can go over a couple of questions that I typically get in my clinic from my families that I have, and from my adults that have come in. Um, a lot of my, um, obviously, new families with young kids will ask me if their kids can play sports. So I think we've kind of gone over that the risks and talking about why sports are important. But I do really try to emphasize with parents about um, if your kids are still like a baby or a toddler, really thinking about them being able to be successful and participate in competitive sports that they can continue maybe throughout their school year. So, you know, before your kids actually get peer pressured, in a sense from their friends all doing some sport and be like, hey, you should do this too. But getting them involved in a sport in an early age that they can be successful and feel good about themselves that maybe isn't one of those high-risk injury sports is a great idea. So you as a parent can kind of guide and help them choose sports or try different sports that don't have those high-risk category that we talked about. Um, the other questions I get a lot are, um, should you wear braces like ankle braces or knee supports to protect during sporting activities? So if your kid's playing soccer, or you are, I should say, as a high school student or a young adult athlete or whatever, if you're trying out a sport, should you wear a brace or an ankle support? And um, it really depends on if you already have a joint issue or you've had a history of ankle sprains or you have some kind of underlying pain in your knee or something of whether you should wear a brace. Because typically we try to um, have the athletes get fit enough that they don't need that extra support, but it has been shown in some sports activities that they have used braces to prevent injuries, and it's actually decreased a lot of injuries that people had. I'm going to use this as a reference, but not recommending that people are linemen on football teams, but in the NFL, some of the linemen have started wearing knee braces, and they've shown that um, by wearing those braces, 
the, rip, the injuries that were being sustained by that football team in that position went down substantially, like more than 50 to 70 percent just by wearing those protective braces. So sometimes braces can have a great influence on your ability to participate and decrease the injuries. Sometimes people get reliant on the brace to give your joint support instead of building up the strength in the muscles around the joint to, for your muscles to give it to, um, the support that it needs for the joints to be protected from injuries. But sometimes some sports, because they have such high risk for ankle sprains or knee injuries, sometimes it is good for them to wear a, like a supportive ankle brace, especially with basketball, or make sure you have shoes that have really good higher ankle support to really prevent that over rolling of the ankle that would cause an ankle sprain. Some of the questions I get from some of my older patients or people that already have joint issues, especially with the elbow, is they really want to work on increasing their muscle strength in their arms. But they get pain in their elbow every time they're trying to lift weights or work out at the gym. So I have worked with the um, patients who come to me in the clinic or even as outpatients to really develop the muscles in the shoulder and around your shoulder blade using resistance bands. But instead of holding on to the resistance band, you can actually tie them around your upper arm so you're taking away the strain on the elbow joint and kind of build up all those muscles first. And then we go back to doing exercises where maybe you're holding on to the resistance bands or using the fitness equipment but you're doing a arm strengthening activity that requires multiple muscles to complete the activity so that you're not just straining the elbow joint, just asking the biceps to lift the weight. You're going to use your shoulder muscles and, and your wrist and some other things to help assist that so you don't get so much stress on that particular joint. So there's many ways that you can modify weightlifting and other types of activities that can decrease stress onto a particular joint that might give you trouble and pain that will still allow you to exercise. Other things you can think about is if your elbow is bothering you, you can always work on your balance, your core strength by doing um, abdominal work. You can do endurance stuff, riding a stationary bike. So just because maybe you can't do activities with one part of your body, the other part of your body that aren't giving you trouble that day, you could still do some kind of fitness, and you can always do stretching to increase your flexibility in the other areas that aren't bothering you. So just remember there's many, many ways of being fit that you can always do some kind of activity throughout the day, and your therapist and your medical team can help you modify things so that you can still participate and be successful. So I think that about wraps up the questions that I had from recently in my clinic. So I want to thank everybody for joining the um, Playing It Safe webinar this evening. I really enjoyed um, giving the presentation and being able to impart this information. And I'm always available for um, questions if people, and um, I have Many, many physical therapists that I know throughout the United States, depending on where you're located. I know most a physical therapist at most of the hemophilia treatment centers across the U.S. because I've been doing this for so many years. So um, I, they are great resources for you and use their knowledge and their expertise to help you be physically active and be able to participate in sports throughout your life. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Grace. Your feedback is critical to us, not only in evaluating, but in planning of future webinars. Please complete this five-minute survey by clicking on the link appearing on your screen now. Thank you for attending. This concludes the program.